be looking at disks. And in the next segment, we'll be looking at file systems, which are overlaid on top of disk. So we'll be primarily focusing on disk hardware and disk scheduling, which have significant impact on overall I.O. performance. Okay. So why have disks? Simply because memory is small. And if you look at the cost per dollar, then disks are significantly cheaper. And also, if you look at the overall power consumption, disks tend to, for example, consume like even the highest performance disks consume like 10 watts per terabyte of data. On the other hand, if you have a terabyte of memory, uh, it can run all the way up to 100 watts or more even. So you're talking about at least 10 times improvement or even significantly more in terms of energy efficiency. Um, and so memory is primarily used for short-term storage, while disks are primarily used for uh, forever, possibly. So they, they're non-volatile, they're persistent, uh, and because of this, they they used to keep things lying around when you want to pass things between processes and applications. But uh, interestingly, with um, as we'll see, disks have certain specific performance characteristics, and they work really well when you access data in a sequential fashion. But if you want random access or you want to access data in a non-sequential fashion, then uh, it becomes harder and their performance doesn't keep up. So if you look at the performance, which is possibly the I.O. operation, the data transfer per watt, uh, per dollar, then the trade-off becomes slightly different. You may actually uh, provision systems with more memory. And this is an interesting trade-off these days because um, a lot of the applications that people use are not necessarily accessing data in a sequential fashion. For example, people like Facebook want to store things like graphs. And in such cases, storing them on the disk is not the best way. Or they have to be laid out in a specific fashion in order to utilize disk performance. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, have a bottom-up um, uh, introduction to disks and file systems. So we first focus on the device characteristics, which dominate performance and reliability. Uh, then we will look at the software aspects that deal with these issues. Okay? And disk capacity has kind of been one of the primary factors driving computer performance for the last 20 years. If you look at it along with uh, processor performance, which grew exponentially, disk capacity also grew exponentially. Not so much the latency and the bandwidth, but um, capacity, just the ability to store enough data grew significantly. File system, no one accesses disks directly. So disks are low level storage that consider data in the form of blocks. But realistically, what we look at is files. Right? And so file systems are great because one, they're persistent and they can take care of underlying unreliability in the hardware. They are hierarchical, they're rich in metadata by storing things more than just files, they store more information. And finally, they, they are indexable, and you can search them and uh, look for files around different parts of the system, whereas if you have disks, pure disks with a simple interface, like memory, you know, just block-based interface, then it's not rich enough to support a lot of the applications. And this is a fundamental difference between uh, memory and disks. Memory, uh, it is an interesting difference because memory also tends to be managed in terms of blocks, but then you, you, what you really overlay on top of memory is data structures. Right? Similarly with disks, data is managed in, the term, in terms of blocks, but you overlay file systems on top of disks. So an interesting uh, issue with disks is just the interface. So normally there are three types of uh, interface. Microdrive is, uh, is, is a unique kind on its own, but Primarily, there are three types of interfaces, the ATA interface, the ones on modern, modern systems are called a single ATA because you can plug only one device on any late channel. Uh, then you've got the SCSI interface, which is uh, in the late 90s, it was the uh, special interface uh, that was set up for improved performance. Uh, and then you have USB, which we're all familiar with, or the IEEE 1394 Firewire. Microdrive was really about small, 
uh, discs which are small in size and small motors, and the primary reason for them is power consumption. The reason these different interfaces exist is because they come with different cost considerations and bandwidth that we'll look at it in a second. And also, they, they have different um, uh, sophisticated scheduling policies, uh, which uh, have varied performance characteristics for different uh, applications. So, for example, SCSI allows the controller commands to be reordered, while ATA does not. So if you look at the bandwidth ratings, and these are what is typically achievable, which is you know you get about 50 megs maximum off the platters. And an interesting question is if you get only 50 megs off the platter, and serial ATA is doing something like three gigabytes a second, three gigabits a second, sorry, which is like 600 megs a second. So why do we care still? If you if your disk performance is not able to keep up with the overall interface, do we still care? Uh, this is because there are lots of different ways in which you can possibly improve performance, possibly by uh, replication. Right? So even if one disk is not supply enough bandwidth, you can possibly replicate the data across two or more end disks and have n times the bandwidth. Um, SCSI typically uh, multiplexes multiple drives in the same bus in order to keep the bus utilization high. Flash, which is an alternative technology, is uh, is an upcoming technology. I would, it's really penetrated a lot in the mobile market. The key question, though, is can it replace disks in the server spectrum? So can we, are we thinking about replacing all storage with flash, okay? And there are a lot of benefits to flash. For example, the, the first is uh, it's only five to six times slower than memory. So if you look at it, disks which tend to be a factor of four or five, you look at it in a second, but disks tend to be a factor of 10 milliseconds away. So compared to that, when you're talking about something that's a few microseconds away, it's a significant boost in terms of performance, three orders of magnitude. Uh, so the question is, does the increase in performance justify the cost? And furthermore, flash is more power efficient than either disk or memory. It has a technology where storing the data and just remembering data is cheap. Disks, on the other hand, cost a lot when, they don't cost a lot when you just need to store data, but when they spin, they cost a lot more because of the spinning motors. Flash, on the other hand, is solid state storage. It does not need any moving parts, which means that when you access the data, it's much cheaper than accessing the disk in terms of power. So an interesting question is, you know, hybrid flash and disk, and how would you use it? So imagine you had flash, right? And you had disk, and you had memory, right? The question is, what are you going to use Flash for? Are you going to use it as a swap space for memory, in which case, you know, what are the issues that you got to think about? Are you going to use it as a cache for the disk, like what Apple does? Uh, and what are the trade-offs with these different issues? Typically, read performance is 90 megs a second, and right, so the bandwidth is not that different from a disk, but it's just latency that's significantly better. Okay, so let's focus on disks. Disks typically tend to be designed with multiple platters, and each platter itself is split up into concentric circles, okay? These are known as tracks. And each track is further split into sectors. Okay, so this is the basic layout. And you have heads that are, so normally you may have dual heads, like in this case where you have your reading of both sides of the platter, and you have these heads that move together, right? So there's a single arm, and these heads are all sticking out. So the heads do not move, do not move in this direction. That is, they all, each of them independently cannot move in this direction. Either they all move in or they all move out. And similarly, they can, and so the big challenge is I can read all sector tools from different sec tracks across the different platters or different surfaces, but I cannot read sector two from platter one and sector one from platter two because the, all the disks, all the heads are on the same position. 
And so data layout needs to be carefully managed. And same and same thing goes with scheduling as well. When you have a bunch of blocks to be looked up, you have to be careful about what order you issue them in. And we'll look at that later. And the main properties of disks are, first of all, uh, the independently addressable seg element is a sector. So you ask for sectors. And a block is really a group of sectors. And OS typically transfers multiple blocks. So you can address a sector, and from that point onwards, it can transfer multiple blocks as, you know, sequentially. Or a disk can directly access any block of information and print it. So, sorry, the operating system can ask the disk to access any block of information. So it can do random access. It's not that it cannot. It's just that when you do sequential I.O., it just is better performance, mainly for the reason that I just showed you. So I will do the math and you'll see it, but these heads are the dominant cost in terms of latency. So they dominate latency. Moving this head is the dominant cost in latency. Uh, the reading of the data itself, like pumping it out, not as much. Real disks actually have zones uh, with more sectors towards the outer edge and fewer sectors towards the inner edge. This is because the circumference of the outer edges uh, is, is longer, obviously, because the radius is longer, right? So this circle is, is wider on the outer uh, edge, which means that it can store more data. Um, most disks, uh, in this case, they have, you assume that all sectors have the same density. We look at alternative organizations where the outer edges may, uh, you may choose alternative layouts. Right? And most this really, what, even though internally they may be organized in different ways, they present a virtual geometry with the OS, which assumes a constant number of sectors per track. And the controller then takes care of mapping the OS's requested sector onto the actual physical sector. So here's an example of this where uh, the physical uh, geometry of the disk is such that uh, you, you have more sectors on the outer, right? So you have two n times two times or n times more sectors on the outer, right? Compared to the inner one. And if you look at the uh, overall uh, organization, though, so in this case, you can see that the uh, number of sectors is the same on the inner and the outer. Right? So in this case, it's all equal. But if you look at it in reality, when it's laid out. Uh, the outer one, as you progressively move towards the outer one at this breakpoint, uh, you see that the outer sectors start to have more sectors in them, twice as many to be specific. And if you look at the cylinders, as I already mentioned, all the heads move in and out together. Uh, and at any given time, the head is on a particular track on a particular flat of the disk. And the cylinder is essentially a, a group of tracks that can be read when the head's in a particular position. So a cylinder is a collection of all the sectors uh, that can be read uh, fr from all the heads uh, when they're in a particular position. Okay. So let's look at each sector. What does a sector contain? So each sector contains a preamble, which is a synchronization marker. Uh, Sector and the preamble itself contains things like uh, sector information, uh, date, and the cylinder. And, and it tells you that the sector is about to start. The other things that that are that do exist are things like uh, the cylinder, the sector number, and typically the whole sector is read into the buffer. So you don't read just one byte of the sector, but you read the whole sector. And you also have uh, there are two important things that are, suff that are suffixes to the sector itself. One is a checksum, uh, which is an error-correcting error code, and this is um, used to recover from transient errors where, you know, single byte flips. Um, and this is pretty common with uh, things like disks, where um, just the system is uh, quite, um, it's not completely unreliable, but it, you know, small transient faults are pretty common. And so to recover from that, you absolutely need, absolutely need ECC uh, checksums. And finally, there's a gap uh, just because of design issues and design tolerance, right? You can't have sectors starting immediately because um, what if there was a small shift in when the system was designed and the sector moved? And so the gap really exists to absorb uh, 
such tolerances or such variances where the sector is made. When you actually burn the sector onto the disk, you, you, it moves slightly. So let's look at the cost to read and write a disk block. Okay. So H3 is split into three components. The first component is known as the seek time, which is what's the time to move the heads to the proper cylinder. And this kind of dominates in most disks. And typically it's around 0.8 milliseconds. When I do the math, you'll see it. Rotational delay is the time for the proper sector to rotate under the head. Uh, so once you move the head into position, you when the disk rotates to, uh, to uh, put the right sector under the head, um, that is known as the rotational delay. And finally, there's the data transfer delay, which is, you know, the heads read the bytes and then they get pumped out into the controller. And so this is the smallest component of the three. An interesting issue is something known as cylinder skew, which is if you had no skew and the disk was rotating in this direction and you laid out a particular sector in this fashion, right? And let's say a disk, uh, your head was over this position, it was reading this uh, sector zero, and it was going to read this and then it was going to read this, right? So let's say it did that. The problem is that as you're reading this sector and you're transferring it out, this one has already flown past, right? So this one is already moved on because the disk is not going to stop rotating, right? It's always spinning, which means that when you're reading out a particular sector, this one has moved on. And so this is a particular challenge and to deal with this, what they do is something on a cylinder skew where they, wherein it's carefully, the skew is carefully designed such that when you finish reading off this and you have time to move the head onto this position and then you know, it just it'll you'll exactly be continue to be reading that sector so you look at what speed the disks are rotating at and you look at what speed your data transfer rates are uh, and then you can kind of design the skew which is you know calculate the skew which is you know so that when you finish reading the first um the first part of the sector uh, you, you can continue on and the second part of the sector is really stored on the outer track or the first part of the sector is stored on the inner track. So the main benefit of this is it allows you to read multiple tracks in one continuous operation without losing the data. Okay. So there are other forms of sector interleaving which is a similar idea where um, what I really want to do is read multiple sectors. It's related to the farmer. In the farmer, we are trying to read one sector in a continuous fashion. In the latter, I'm trying to read multiple sectors in a continuous fashion. Right? It's a zero, one, two, sequential. And I want um, essentially them to be transferred continuously without having to move ahead. When the controller is busy transferring one sector of data to the memory, the other sector may fly by the head. And so what you do is you displace it. So when the controller is reading zero, four may fly by, but you still have access to one. And similarly, when you're reading one, five may fly by, but then you still have access to two, and so on and so forth. So let's look at this scheduling. And before that, so what we're gonna first look at is look at the dominant latency costs, and then we look at the different kinds of scheduling policies. So there are three types of uh, delays. The seek time, the time which is required to move the R to the proper cylinder, the rotational time, which is the time for the proper sector to rotate under the head, and then the data transfer time. So the overall layout in, in general, the big picture with this is that the disks have a higher level program interface, which is using an open, close, read, write, you know, commands for that. Then you've got the device independent interface, which is similar to the I.O. In this case, you have read block, write block, or seek, which it has to be aware of the properties of the disk. And finally, then you have the hardware disk. So let's look at the latency of factors affecting uh, disk transfer. So like I said, read time is seek time plus latency, plus transfer time, okay? In this case, I'm gonna use a seek time of 5.6 milliseconds. Um, okay, let me check. So I'm gonna use a seek time of 5.6 milliseconds. Just remember the numbers and as you go forward, you see it. I'm gonna use a rotational time of two, three milliseconds and a transfer time. 
you look at which factors vary based on the disk properties. So software really has, an important thing to note is the software really has access to a virtual disk space, which really consists, thinks of the disk as a linear array of sectors, right? One to n, each of a certain size. And however, hardware has a structure. You know, you need to think about which platter, which track within the platter, and which sector within the track. So you need to be aware of this in order to uh, perform scheduling. And the hardware structure fundamentally affects the latency. If, for example, reading from the same sector in the same track is fast, reading from the same cylinder group is fast. For example, reading all tracks across all the platters at the same position, that's fast, right? But if anything else is going to be substantially slower, as we'll see. So most of disk scheduling is really about, uh, or disk addressing is about mapping um, a virtual disk interface of file blocks, which is just sequential, onto or, or the other way around. So mapping a 3D structure, which consists of tracks and sectors and platters, on to a virtual structure, which is just a sequential one. So the idea behind accessing the disk is all you got to guarantee is or the mapping addressing guarantees that block n plus one should be as close as possible to n. Okay. And then the operating system can simply take care of scheduling such that it minimizes the distances the overall head moves by making sure that adjacent sectors, uh, you don't move the head much between adjacent sectors. Okay. So let's look at three cases, right? I'm going to have a splatter. I'm going to map data to the outermost sector. I'm going to map it to the innermost sector, sorry, innermost track. And then I'm going to map it to the middle one. Note that the outermost ones have more sectors uh, than the inner ones, right? We spoke about that which means that more data can be transferred per rotation. So when this thing rotates once, more data can be transferred from the outer ones than the inner ones, okay? So let's say that elements map to the middle of the disk, in which case your seek time and your rotational time are fixed. Your data transfer time is the variable component. So let's look at the transfer time. The transfer time essentially is composed of two components. The time for evolution, which is fixed, is based on the design of the disk, and so the disk typically spin at a fixed uh, latency, sorry, fixed rotational speed, and the number of revolutions required to transfer the data. So if you have more tracks, uh, so let's say that I want to transfer two zero um, um, four eight sectors, okay? If you have more sectors, um, then it's better because per rotation I could be transferring more data. So overall, if you look at the, so let's do the max of one of these, right? So in this case, you see that the transfer time is kind of dominant, but it's not really the case. In most cases, this 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 factor dominates. But I'm just doing the maths to help you visualize um, uh, how to calculate this latency. So. The transfer time is time per revolution, the number of revolutions required to transfer the data. The number of revolutions required to transfer the data is proportionate to how many sectors you have per uh, on, with the, on this track itself. So time per revolution is six. Uh, in this case, the middle of the disk had 44.4 sectors and I wanted to transfer 2048. So overall, this worked out to 37 milliseconds. So the the first two are constant terms. This both of these are constant, and this one is a variable term in this case. So let's consider what happens if the elements map to the inner tracks of the platter. So inner tracks of the platter have fewer sectors because the circumference is smaller. In such cases, it's going to take you longer to transfer the same amount of data because per rotation you're transferring fewer sectors. Finally, the outer ones are the fastest because you have more sectors, which means it requires per rotation, requires the least amount of time to transfer. And overall, you can see that in this case, the factor of one is to close to two and a half. Right? So between transferring something from the outer to the inner. So it's really important you think about what you lay on the outer layer of the outer tracks versus the inner tracks. 
if you have random access on the other hand, now it really, this really shows you the difference between random and the sequential. In the previous case, these two factors are constant because it didn't have to move, but or the head didn't have to move. But if you look at it, if you have random access, then you also need to take into consideration the latency required for the heads, which means that these are no longer constant. For every sector that you transfer, you got to bear the latency as well, which means you can see that you just suddenly bumped up from you know something like 16 milliseconds to 17 seconds of three orders of magnitude difference. This is where things like SSD and RAM or DRAM or memory differ significantly from disk. Discs are awesome for sequential performance, but anything other than that, and they suffer, especially with you know, random access. Whereas SSDs and RAM do not distinguish between sequential and random access. And if you look at applications, it really depends on whether they're going to use random or sequential. But in a lot of the cases these days, they do not use uh, sequential. It's very hard for applications to do that. So there are a lot of things you got to think about, right? If you're playing a video of your hard drive and this skips, for example, then you got to defragment to make sure that the video blocks are all continuous. Uh, and so you really have to make sure that once in a while you make sure you, you um, take, you clean a garbage collect all the blocks on the disk and make sure that all the layout of the files are all continuous in order to extract maximum performance. In a multi-program environment, you can have, if you have multiple applications running at the same time, you can have a queue of disk requests being formed. And you have control over scheduling um, these requests. The goal of this scheduling is to maximize throughput. I want to get done with the entire queue as fast as possible. It's not worried about an individual request. It's not worried about how long that takes, but it just wants to get everything done in the queue as fast as possible, in the least amount of time. And the question is, how do you do that? So, OS maximizes disk I.O. by essentially minimizing head movement. So remember that we spoke about surfaces, tracks, and sectors, and we said that all of this maps to ensure that um, sector N, so the virtual disk essentially exports a single interface, like an array, like a single one-dimensional array, and it's got sectors. And it ensures that essentially things which are next to each other in the array also are next to each other on the disk, or they need to move less, the head less to get to those positions. So sector N is very close to N plus one and N plus two, but not to something like two N. And we know this information. So what the OS max does, it maximizes IO throughput by minimizing head movement. So the key goal for us is to minimize head movement. And this scheduling seeks to achieve that. So let's look at an example. So let's assume a set of requests. The queue is built in uh, this order. We have 150 before we have 16. So it, it goes in this direction, okay? So if you look at the way this whole thing is gonna work, initially our position is at 65, okay? So uh, the first request is satisfied 150. So let's just process the request in the order in which they came, right? So if you do that, then, um, uh, first you move to 150, then back, then back again. This is particularly bad because you see uh, you have alternative, um, between, you're alternating between uh, lower numbered sectors and higher numbered sectors. So you're constantly moving back and forth, okay? So this is pretty bad. And so if you look at the overall, um, you know, first come, first serve scheduling, then you kind of moved 550 tracks. How did we arrive at that number? Essentially, when the 60, when this one, this head moves to this, the, you moved 150 minus 65, right? So that moved uh, 85 tracks. And then when you move from 150 to 16, you moved 134. And similarly, and so on and so forth, until you, you accumulate this over all the requests, and then you land up with 550. If you do greedy scheduling, which is essentially do the shortest time first, then what you effectively do is you you essentially arrange the request in an order in which, for example, you first monotonically, so let's say these are the disk numbers, 
you monotonically increase so you land on something like the curve like this or a curve like this so you go always move in one direct kind of move in one direction so what if you satisfy it from the current position of the disk so in this case i'm at 65 so i start i sort it based on that and so I first get 72 82 147 150 i reach the end i don't have anything more than 150 then i start moving to the other side right? so i'm going to go like this right and then like this right? so Let's look at that. Okay. And so the idea is that at any given position, you don't try to move back and forth, but you try to move in one direction and then move the other one. The and this one had 2.1. So the question is, can we do better? So most systems use what's known as scan scheduling, which is essentially um, you rearrange the queue such that uh, you always move in one direction until you satisfy um, all the requests in that direction, and then you move in the reverse. This is also known as elevator scheduling. So if you look at it in this case, I'm going to keep moving in this direction until I satisfy, you know, 16, for example. And I have no more requests that direction, and I start moving in the opposite direction. Right? So, so this is slightly different from um, shorter styles, seek time first. And so in this case, your head would move 187 tracks. C-scan, which is a variant of this, is you move in one direction until the edge of the disk is reached. Okay, so, and then you reset it. So, in compared to elevator scheduling, which would have moved it back to 72, this would have been elevator. Right? C-scan essentially resets it. So it's like a typewriter. You see, you so scan it, you move all the way back, and then you start again. Right? And so, C scan is um, quite different from uh, elevator. So look scheduling is the same as C scan, except that the head is reset when no more requests exist between the current head position and the edge of the uh, disk. Disks, you notice that because of this, that um, seeking sectors is an expensive proposition and you're trying to minimize the movement of the heads. So if you had logical information that a certain piece of data will never exist across um, certain boundaries, then you can terminate seeks at that point. Right? If you knew, for example, a certain file will never exist in a different, uh, a certain subset of the disk. So what uh, this is what partitioning is used for. And so what partitioning does is it's, it's, it's your disk is split up to maximize to logically by software to minimize the seek time. So you know that you're never going to, if a certain partition, for, let's say that partition A exists between 0 to 10, and partition B exists between uh, 2 to 3, right? Sorry, uh, 20 to 30. In such cases, when you're seeking, you will, and you know for a certain file, and you know that you're in partition A, you'll never look past the this edge. So effectively, your, your partitioning makes the disk appear to be smaller than it actually is, which improves overall disk scheduling because you can make sure that the head doesn't have to keep moving too much right imagine for example if your head had to move if your head had, had to move all the way to partition uh, c and then back right this would be bad so i've put up an example and you can find this on my slide i would encourage you to go work this uh, example and uh, look at how disk scheduling impacts uh, you look at how are the different scheduling algorithms impact um, overall disk performance. Overall, uh, in general, disks are getting smaller in size, mainly for power con power concerns. So smaller means spin faster. The head has less distance to travel. Disks do get denser, uh, and getting cheaper is an artifact of that. In the sense that the, uh, if you have more data per four data per dollar, essentially. Disks are getting faster. On the other hand, um, you only get a five to ten percent improvement every year, or two to three x every decade. Right? We, and disks, on the other hand, capacity grows at two times every year. And if you look at it over a factor of a whole decade, that's a factor of two to the ten. Right? So it's like thousand x factor improvement. On the other hand, bandwidth improves only by ten. And this is the essentially the problem. Right? There's a 300x different in terms of latency compared to capacity growth, and there's a 10x different in terms of bandwidth. So getting to the same data today is slower than 10 years ago, for example. 
An interesting question with discs is how do you improve performance with when in this context, right? So my latency is not improving, disk capacity is improving, um, my bandwidth is not improving, but disk capacity is improving, right? So disk capacity is always going at a factor of 2x. And the question is, uh, how can we exploit that to improve overall performance, okay? So what systems do the, is something known as RAID. So RAID stands for redundant array of inexpensive disks. So redundant array of cheap, I'm just going to use the term cheap, cheap disks. Okay, so you have com commercial disks and you're trying to improve performance with them and their capacity is growing. So the first thing that you do in order to improve performance is just replication. Oh, sorry, uh, it's just partitioning. So you have multiple disks, okay? You take the data on your disk and you partition it, uh, data on your files and you partition it. So you ensure, this is like partitioning in a way, except that partitioning is within a disk, while well, here essentially you kind of, let's say you stored each partition on a different disk. So because of this, each of these heads, first of all, can move independently. And so you could be reading multiple partitions at the same time. And you're also transferring all of these in parallel. Right? And so overall performance is significantly better. And if you have truly random access and your data access is all uniformly distributed, then you get n times the bandwidth of n is the number of disks you use in your system to partition. So effectively what this is doing is that it's logically creating larger disk blocks from disks which you know, which are really have smaller disk blocks. So at each given time, it could be transferring one, two, and three. So it's transferring one, two, and three, a big block all at once. So if you want to increase reliability and at the same time improve uh, bandwidth, then uh, mirroring is used. So RAID 1 is about disk mirroring. So we have, RAID is essentially a hierarchical, um, uh, it's, it's taxonomy. So you have different types of RAID. We look at all the way up to RAID 5, right? And each one has, is designed for a specific purpose. Okay. So the first one was RAID 0, which is essentially stripe your data across the different disks. RAID 1, on the other hand, is I'm going to replicate the data so that I get better reliability. One of the disks fail, I still have the other one to rely upon. And I have twice the uh, bandwidth. 2x the bandwidth, maybe half the latency because I can transfer each um, a different. Um, if I want to transfer two times the data, then it takes me half the time. Unfortunately, the only challenge with this is when you have writes, they kind of have to be go to both, uh, both to both the disks, and this can get quite expensive. So, when you have writes like this, the big challenge is who controls the RAID. You could have hardware control it, which is what most systems do, uh, where you have something plugged into the PCI card that actually is going to do the uh, replication. It's going to push out the data to both the disks. And the big challenge is just you have to buy the card, you know, it costs a certain amount of money. Uh, but in these cases, it, it, the hardware has kind of won out. Okay? Most people don't use software. It's, the big challenge with hardware, though, is serial reconstruction. So if something fails, you got to construct back from a, in a serial fashion because hardware doesn't have a lot of limitations. Uh, writes are quite a bit faster, and so the hardware will really improve the performance for write-intensive workloads, especially as you look at uh, in the next few slides, writes are more than just, you got to make it go to the two disks. There's also the checksum calculation, uh, and that is also expensive if you needed the CPU to do that. And with Paddle, uh, with software-based RAID, the biggest benefit is just Paddle reconstruction of the lost disk. The cost factor is not that much of an issue these days. Um, it, the, the big disadvantage, though, it may tie up the CPU to compute parity, and you're essentially fetching the block uh, byte by byte from the disk into memory and then calculate parity on that, which is expensive. It screws up with your CPU caches as well. The next thing we're going to look at is RAID 3, RAID 4, and RAID 5. So RAID 3, so there are a couple of issues. One is just parity calculation, which is, uh, you note that RAID 0 and RAID 1 had, you replicated the data, but you didn't calculate any uh, error correct, you didn't have any error correction codes, okay? Uh, this also how is the data striped across the disks. RAID 3 does byte-wise striping, really fine grain, okay? And so if you had, um, 
a byte 101, then it will be stored in this fashion. Okay, so compared rate four and five and zero, this one is doing um, is doing byte by byte striping, and this is entirely based on the fact as to how your data is going to be accessed by your application. So in this case, rate three believes that the application is going to access um, the the program's going to access the file byte by byte possibly, and so it's trying to improve performance for that. RAID 4 does block interleave parity striping. So what it does is it allocates a certain disk specifically for parity. Parity is a form of error correction, right? So essentially what it's doing for a parity bit is an XOR on the data itself. So you take each of these individual elements and you perform an XOR on them and then you line up with parity, right? And so parity can uh, correct a uh, single bit flips in, an, so it depends on how many bits you dedicate for parity, but n bit parity can correct n minus uh, one flips in the in the data itself. So it allows the system to c recover from a crash to any one of these disks. So if this disk went down, for example, uh, parity can allow you to recover from that. And that's the big benefit of this. The big challenge with this, though, is you now dedicate a separate disk for parity, and so you kind of lost the capacity. More importantly, if this disk fails, then you lose your recovery uh, capability. RAID 5, on the other hand, improves upon RAID 4 by saying that I'm going to use block interleaved uh, parity striping. So instead of dedicating a separate disk just for parity, I'm going to interleave the parity amongst the different disks, uh, amongst the data on the different disks, right? So in such cases, um, it's useful because even if one of these disks fail, you can use the other ones to recover from it. The only thing you got to ensure is that um, that this disk is not storing its own parity, because in which case you're not going to be able to recover from it. Right. So you got to make sure that the parity of a given disk is co-located on some other 